What's up, friends? Welcome back to another edition of Believe in Big Ten. Here with you on Sirius XM Radio, joined by my friends from the Believe in Buckeyes podcast today. Rhett Lewis now hanging out with Chimdi Chekwa and Bryant Browning, uh, both former Buckeyes, and uh, of course do a fantastic job uh, here with us on the Believe Network, breaking down all things Buckeyes. And that's Really what we're going to get into uh, here in just a second, I want to remind you that you can check out uh, our show wherever you download your podcasts. Of course, I invite you to comment down there and get into the conversation with us and be sure to check out the latest recap episode on Believe in Big Ten out now wherever you get your podcast. Uh, also, drop a comment on the YouTube channel and, and we'll get in there and answer some questions for you that you might have about your favorite Big Ten team. Plenty of conversation around these Ohio State Buckeyes, fellas, number three team in the land rocking and rolling right now undefeated coming off the 49 to 14 victory uh, over Marshall did what they had to do right what we all right. expected them to do yep. uh Jim do you want to start with you here and then Brian if you jump in let but before we get into like what that game meant and then what next weekend or this weekend is going to look like against Michigan State if you had if you guys had a priority list right of what you needed to see from these Ohio State Buckeyes this year in order to get beyond that final regular season game hump and get into the college football playoff and make some noise. What were the things that you had to see this Buckeyes team do? Jimmy, let me start with you. Yeah, I think a consistent run game, one that, you know, regardless of what the defense is doing, regardless of what the opponent is doing, that you can just can commit to it and execute. Um, and that's what's been lacking, I think, the last – a couple years, and that's something that we expect in Ohio State. So it's it's kind of a surprise that it's been lacking. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. And outside yeah. of that, you know, just the the uh, consistency on special teams and just really the the organization, right? Like yeah. be able to execute what um, you know you you you've gone out to do. And I think that's what slipped the last couple of years. And you know they've had the talent, but you can just see that there was just a, a lack of ability to really execute the game plan in certain situations. Brian, what do you have to add on that? Man, it's funny. Obviously, me and Tim do the show together, but he kind of yeah. still in my answers, man. It's all about <laughs> running the ball. I, 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 as a former well, offensive lineman, 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 I get you. Yeah, yeah. right, right. It's all about running the ball, and obviously the last several years, uh, it just have not been consistent. Coach Day, I believe, has made an emphasis on it, and the big thing as an offensive lineman, um, and this goes just in football in general, you want to be able to run the ball when everybody knows you are going to run the ball, right? It's no, it doesn't feel like it has to be like a surprise. Then, oh, they they snuck a, they did a sneak a, sneak attack and got off right. a good run against us. No, be out there, be able to go out there, execute the run plays, get into the fits, get some guys moved, and be able to kind of uh, exploit a defense by doing so. So obviously, there was an emphasis on that. Um, and this past weekend, we did a great job. This, you know, there you go. I, mean, I was gonna say, check, check. <laughs> right, right. But this yeah. week, uh, start off the season still a little rocky, right? But this yeah. last week, you know, we, we executed on all levels and you we had a lot of big ones kind of rip off. So that was my thing. Uh, because yeah. like you stated, it gets down to the end of the season, it gets down to that last game of the season. We all know what we're talking about there against uh, the team yep. up north. You got to be able to run the ball, you want to be able to win the rushing battle. And over the last couple of years, we have not been able to do so. Yeah, so look, obviously Quinchon Judkins comes in, guys, and you're like, holy smokes. Like, all of a sudden, we just we might have just become the best backfield duo in America, right, with uh, yeah. Travion Henderson, you know, who comes back this year. Uh, and then you watch Quinch this, – this game – and now, look, I know – we know Marshall is not going to be the ultimate barometer on what Ohio State's success looks like this year, but this was the game you're like, all right, this is what Q can do. Right, 14 carries, 173 yeah. yards, Bryant, and then Chimdi, I'll come back to you on that. How then, like, where have you seen the run game be most successful this year, Bryant, uh, with both Quinchon and Travion and what this offensive line has looked like in front? Yeah, I mean, I feel like Jack, is, to be honest, he's really a cheat code, right? I mean, he just kind of go out there, and if he gets to the second level clean, like, we got him square, he's running, at flip, like, chances are you're just not going to catch him, right? And then yeah. I was able to kind of see that uh, this past weekend with an 86-yard touchdown run where he could have, Obviously, just kept running right on to the locker room if he wanted to. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's just, I mean, him coming in is a special. It's, it's special that we have two guys like that that have the ability to make all the plays, make the cuts, run inside, run outside, and then obviously have the speed to take it the distance. So, um, 
Yeah, I don't know what they did to kind of you know to get Justin to come on in because you know he was a what all SEC two years in a row. Should he probably should be in the NFL? Right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He decided to come back for one more year of college football at Ohio State, and you know, I, obviously, um, I'm ecstatic that he's there. Uh, but it definitely means a lot that you know his ability, his yeah. mindset for him and Henderson to kind of split those carries and what they're doing uh, out there on Saturdays. So, Jim, do you, like when you put some of these numbers in perspective, he's the fifth active running back in college football to have 3000 career rushing yards, right? Which, yeah. which he achieved the longest run by a Buckeye with that 86 yard score since Eddie George back in 1995. <laughs> There's been some damn good backs that have come along since then too. So just to, just to think about, you know, that kind of explosiveness and, and then obviously with your defensive background, like how dangerous does that make this offense? It makes them so dangerous. And yeah. it's because it's, it's it's low risk to just to run the ball, yeah. But man, the explosive the, the explosiveness of those two running backs behind the offensive line was playing very very good, right? I mean, we actually we wanted to see good, a good run game, but they've been really dominant uh, up yeah. front these last couple games actually. And you have to sell out to stop it. That's the thing, like to just stop that, to just contain th- those guys as a defense. You have to sell out. That means you're putting yeah. a lot of pressure on the cornerbacks. That means you're putting a lot of pressure on safeties and one-on-one coverage against slot receivers. And guess who's in those slot receivers, those positions? Uh, Jeremiah Smith. Oh, yeah. You can, can go up top at any point in time. <laughs> Mecca Buka, who gets the ball, and he's dangerous um, with it. So that's what we wanted to see, the attention to detail and being able to do something that can't be stopped. Uh, you always talk about, like, Jordan and Kobe, they had a move that just can't be stopped. And then That's when you it. go to stop it, there's a, there's a bunch of counters to it. And who better to have uh, calling those plays than Chip Kelly? Um, so yeah. I think that they're well built to go on this run. Um, and I think it starts with that, being able to be dominant in, in, in that in that phase of the game. Yeah, and, and Brian, like to your point, it's like, uh, you know, you want to be able to run when everyone knows you're going to. You want to have that, like, four-minute offense mentality for 60 minutes, right? Like, everybody knows you you need to run it, you're going to run it, and you still – uh, run it right down their throats. Chimney, I want to come back with you, uh, with you here for a second because you had mentioned Chip Kelly. Um, you know, when you look at the explosiveness of this offense, as you talked about, four completions in three runs of 25 plus yards, scoring plays of 40, 53, 68, and the aforementioned 86 yarder from Quinshawn Judkins. Uh, where would your early season report card be on the play calling and, uh, you know, the offense really now under the direction of Chip Kelly? Yeah, A's across the board, and and not so much because of scheme, just because of structure. I think, you know, one thing that me and, me and Brian got, got frustrated about the last couple of years, somewhat, and I'm speaking for him a little bit, is <laughs> at times it just felt like the attention to detail wasn't there. It felt like they weren't in sync on the offensive line. It just felt like there wasn't an identity sometimes. It wasn't a plan. Still talent, still big plays, all those things, still a bunch of wins, right? But it seems like small things were missing. And part of that I attribute to Ryan Day calling the plays, running the offense, running the team, making sure he's uh, he's raising the money for NIL. Like, right. there was just too much responsibility for one individual at this high level. I think bringing in somebody that you trust to take control of that offense now brings a little bit more structure. And then it's a guy who has had coaching experience. It's a guy who's been there, done that, and the progression from week to week on what they're running, how they're running it, you can also see you could see the plan just as a spectator. Um, and I think that's something that's been missing, and that's gonna that's gonna be huge for them to continue to improve. Because I always say teams yeah. have to continue to improve, improve throughout the season to really be ready ready come playoff, national championship, uh, Big Ten championship, Michigan game, and you can see the progression, the intentional progression. Um, from what the offense is doing. Guys, I, I want to first uh, remind our viewers to check out the old melon hat here. <laughs> you know what I mean here, guys? Uh, yeah, I, nice guys are believers nice in melon as well. Um, and I do consider the lid to be, you know, a lot of times the most important part of an outfit. Um, now, look, if you've been catching up with us regularly here on Believe in Big Ten, you know I do love my hats. Uh, don't really leave home or podcast without one. Um, but if you wear the same hat over and over again, uh, 
you know, I feel like you guys, you know, you ever get out there, you're mowing the grass, you come back inside, and now we've got the sweat stains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's where melon comes in, right? These things are are geared and engineered to be five times more durable than your typical hat. So here's the thing that I also love about this melon hat is the versatility. Right. So whether you are tailgating at the grass lots across from the rock in Bloomington, Indiana, uh, or maybe walking around Haymarket near Memorial Stadium in Lincoln, or maybe somewhere in and around Ohio Stadium at the shoe tailgating, it's got the all weather fit. So whether it's September or November, right, when you got to win those big games in this conference, you can get that thermal series and keep that lid warm uh, as well. The thermal collection with different levels of warmth to keep you on the go this winter. So like, I, I guess from, from this perspective, fellas, we could go from USC in LA to Rutgers in Piscataway and be totally outfitted yeah. in melon gear all yeah. weather all year long. So if you're looking for a hat that's as tough as you, check out melon. You won't wear anything else after you get one for yourself. All right, back to the football here, fellas. We last left off talking about this offense here. And Bryant, I want to get your opinion on Will Howard because when I talked to him this summer, he told me that coaching – was one of the biggest reasons he came to Columbus. He wanted to be coached by Chip Kelly. He wanted to be coached by Ryan Day. And, you know, the, the rest of the offensive coaching staff, Brian Hartline, Justin Fry, like all those guys that come together to form a really talented coaching staff. I, I'm curious how you've seen Howard develop through these first four weeks of the season. Uh, well, I just feel like when he's playing, he's playing with a lot of confidence, right? And obviously he has the experience of as he could that could match anyone in college football. Yeah. Um, and as he come in, you know, you 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 obviously he has a transfer. He's playing for a much, I'm not going to say, a bigger program now, right? A lot more yeah. eyes, a lot more people in the stadium. And to be fair, to be, we're honest, a lot tougher uh, media base, right? Our, our, yeah. our fans are, you know, we, yeah. we, you, know <laughs> you, you, you go out there and score 24 points and, all of a sudden, people's like, "What's up with the backup?" You know, they kind of questioning <laughs> yeah. your, your, your. It's forty eight or bust yeah. around here, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. So, <laughs> uh, but I think he's been handling it well. Uh, I think he's you know, his comments and his uh, his quotes. You know, he's just kind of saying that you know he knows he only had one year at Ohio State. He's going to enjoy all the moments that he can and just kind of uh, you know try to lead this team to to all of their goals. And I think he's you know he's off to a very very good start. Um, looks confident. Um, looks yeah. like he's able to make uh handle the decision making out there on the field because uh, obviously you're talking about Chip Kelly's office, right? We got options, we got different yes. run pass options, we got the actual option with him and a running back, things of that nature that will be in the offense. And he's been just really been doing a great job of taking care of the ball for one, being confident, and just kind of really knowing his job is to get the ball to the playmakers and let them make big plays. Jimmy, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, you know. Coming in, and he, Brian talks about our fan base, there was, there was a lot of doubters on, you know, what Will Howard could do if he was really an upgrade from a quarter year before. I think what Ohio State did this offseason, and not just with Will Howard, really across the board, is they acquired or retained experience. Um, and if you look at the last national champion, which is a team of North that I don't really like talking too much about. Asterisk. But- Asterisk. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Asterisk. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, Asterisk. Asterisk on them. Um, but – they had a, a ton of talented players, but those talented players had a lot of experience. Um, and what we've kind of been lacking the, the last couple, a few years, we obviously had the talent, but not being able to bring it all together. What Will Howard brings to this team, a really talented offense that he's going to have right at his disposal, but he brings the ability to command the huddle. He brings the ability to make the checks, make the decisions, take care of the football, which is what I think Ryan Day is looking for, how do we limit the mistakes? How do we make sure we get everybody in the right place and make the right decisions with good accuracy? If we can do those things, it's going to be tough to beat us. Um, so I think that that approach works with a guy like Will Howard, who's been there, he's seen a lot of football, and he has a, the, the ability to, to get it done. Jim, did you expect more in the run game from Will Howard uh, at the quarterback spot or just maybe they haven't needed it, so there's no reason to put him at risk in that way? What's your thought on that one? Yeah, I think it's in, I think it's there, right? I think they they they're preparing for it. They obviously haven't needed it yet, but I think one of the 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 key decision the key decision points of bringing a guy like Will Howard in to bring a, a bigger athletic quarterback who can yeah. handle the hits, 
who can uh, make some plays in the run game, make it tough on the defense to be able to stop that run. So I, I think it's it, it's it's in the mix, and I think it's going to be used more in high leverage situations when we're playing against a, a team up north, when we're playing against some of the uh, Oregon and others. Yeah. Where we can really utilize this to to you know get the numbers on the defense and be able to put the ball in a wheelhouse of hands to go make make some plays. Okay, last one on the offense here for you, Bryant. Um, Jeremiah Smith, uh, exceeding expectations, or is this about what you thought? <laughs> I'm going to say exceeding. I mean, obviously, okay. there was a lot of hype about you know yes. everything. Him, him committing to Ohio State. Oh, my gosh. I remember that around, moment, around, right? Right. In that right. Ryan Day press conference where he like he's like, oh, thank yeah, God. Yeah, about to faint, right? <laughs> and then all the things you hear about him um, in practice, right, leading up in spring and then in fall, all the yeah. things. And I think like kind of going out there, you know, it was a big opportunity for him to th- not live up to all of that, right? Like, because it, it was so much, right? It was like, you know, everybody's kind of like, oh, this is the next Marvin Harrison Jr. Like, man, this guy just was a Heisman finalist. You just kind of put him right there as a true <laughs> freshman. Uh, but he's really been this kind of uh, living up to par, man. And I think he's been doing a, a fantastic job at, you know, making the plays that come to him. I think that goes back to coaching and the receiver room that he's in, right? You got a lot of talented guys around. He understands that, you know, he, he has to learn. He has yeah. to grow. And when he has his number called on Saturdays to tr- to make a play, obviously, I don't know if you caught his very first pass at Ohio State, he dropped, right? Wide open, <laughs> he drops it, right? Yeah. And then we kind of come right back to him. And he started making some catches. He started getting some touchdowns. I do and, love that. You know, and that's just, I mean, that just goes to show that, you know, he's here for the long run. I think we probably only have him. We should. I'm just throwing it out. We probably only have him for three seasons, right? <laughs> yeah. Go on to play on Sundays. And uh, I think he's kind of going about it the right way. But I definitely think he has uh, basically met expectations and doing a great job at just kind of buying into the team and doing his job and making plays when it, when his number's called. Yeah, for sure. I, I would agree. I mean, it's so much fun to watch. And then obviously, uh, Abuka has the big game from the receiver standpoint in, yeah. in this last win. And so that, that's what Ohio, that's, that's what makes him so dang uh, tough to deal with, right? Is that, it, you know, any guy can make a big play uh, at and any that, point. And they're doing this. I mean, they're throwing curls, right? Slants, taking it for taking 40, it. 50. Like, these aren't even the, the, the plays. These Shot aren't the team right? plays that <laughs> right, right. Kip Kelly has in the playbook. So it's right. been impressive. Uh, Chimney, back to you now as we switch to the defense. And then uh, I do want to get your thoughts before we get out of here, both of you, just on the on the Big Ten landscape and then what this Michigan State matchup looks like. But just to dig in on the state of the defense right now. Look, against Marshall, look, they let up the opening you know, drive touchdown, but then only one one other score beyond that. They were on the field for 36 minutes, but only average, only gave up an average of 3.8 yards per play. Th- that still feels like winning defense. Where are you at right now overall on the defensive side? Yeah, this Marshall game, and when they go back and watch the film, they're probably getting <laughs> torn, <laughs> torn apart a little bit by the coaches. Not, not. I mean, I thought it wasn't a terrible game. Right. Um, but there was a lot of minor mistakes that build up to a frustrating outing overall. Um, and part of that is, you know, they didn't do much defensively. They just kind of played base defense and Marshall had a good game plan and Marshall made some plays. Um, but also a part of it is there were some mistakes made. And those are mistakes that you prefer to have against a Marshall that you can clean up in the yeah. next game. Um, but I think this defense this is a very, very talented defense, a very, very experienced defense. They are – what it comes down to for me is really, you know, how do they utilize the talent, right? Because they have a lot of guys um, that, are, that, are, that are versatile. Yeah. They're safeties. They're linebackers. They can do different things. They're defensive ends. They can drop in coverage. They can, they can, they can rush. But how they come together and how they use that talent um, to be able to continue to, to, to build is going to be what I'm kind of looking for. And – yeah, I, I'm expecting as they start Big Ten playing, I'm not expecting to see those same levels of mistakes that we saw right. versus versus Marshall. And I'm expecting a, a, a attacking defense, a little bit more creativity in the in blitz packages than we've seen that we, we saw a year ago with Jim Knowles as a, a D coordinator. So uh, you know, I, I think moving forward, we're going to see a very we we already the numbers already yeah. show a top defense, but I think that these next couple of games we're going to see a very very um, good defense, and with the talent that's there, there's no reason they wouldn't be one of the one of the better defenses to actually come through Ohio State. Yeah, no question. Uh, last one here on the defense before we move on here, Bryant. For you, uh, this linebacker core is different, but it's not new to Ohio State, right? Uh, with the departures of Eichenberg and um, and, and uh, Steel Chambers, but. Okay. 
Sonny Styles comes in, you know, after having kind of a versatile role, um, you know, a safety role, a nickel role, and now as as a second level defender, what would have been the early returns on on that front? Uh, well, you just see that he's he's learning the position. Obviously, yeah. we we know what type of talent Sonny Styles is. I mean, he's a very if you if you next to he's a big guy. Oh yeah, he's a, he's a strong guy, and he has some speed to him as well. And obviously, he's now never, never been afraid of contact. Uh, but he's definitely learning. Obviously, learning a new position because as linebacker from safety, obviously things are happening a little bit faster, right? And if you're not if you're not in the right places when it comes to to fits and run games and things of that nature, they could kind of they could turn a decent play and turn into a big play for the offense. So um, I think he's definitely uh, up for the task. Obviously, he's been learned a lot to even get to this point, right? Because, you know, obviously we got – we Ohio State, right? We got time to get guys everywhere. And, That's right. Uh, a lot of uh, – and also in that linebacker room. So to see him kind of make that transition and kind of go out there and uh, stick his nose in there, I yeah. think he's doing a fair job. Uh, but he definitely has some room to improve yeah. as we kind of get into Big Ten ball. Uh, and I'm just really – Anxious, you know, and, and, and excited to see him step up to the task because, you know, it's time for him to kind of get some more of those big hits from that linebacker position and kind of go out there, there and, and, and stick in some holes and maybe some tackles for loss and things of that nature and see him kind of catch some guys uh, before the play get going as we know he's capable of doing. And that will be vital as we get into conference play. For Ohio State this week in East Lansing, taking on Michigan State, looking for their ninth straight victory uh, since losing back in 2015. Won't bring that up too loudly here with our friends, Chimdi Chekwa and Brian Browning. Uh, all right, Chimdi, let's talk a little bit about Michigan State. What does this matchup look like to you? Yeah, Michigan State is playing some some solid uh, football. Um, just watching them and then watching them the last – couple years, they seem like a formidable opponent. Um, yeah. You know, they have a, a young quarterback who is someone who's going to turn the ball over. <laughs> like, that's How they, much are you like, looking at your chops <laughs> if you're a DB back in your Buckeye days? Too, right now. Tip, tips and overthrows are live this game for sure. Uh, but if he if they are able to take care of the ball, um, they, they are a, a opponent that can make some plays. And given what the defense, the our Ohio State defense had challenges with against Marshall, if they don't fix those issues, there are awesome plays to be made. If you're from, um, if you're looking at it from Michigan State standpoint, I do believe that this game isn't going to end up being very close. I think there, it, I think it's going to be a competitive game, but I don't think it's going to be very close. I think, um, you know, that defense, that Ohio State defense, is likely going to force some of those turnovers. Um, and I think that's what would really is going to end up being the real difference in the game. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, Aiden Childs has thrown seven interceptions thus far, three this last week. So uh, taking care uh, of the football will be of prime importance for the Spartans against this talented Ohio State defense. All right, last one here quickly for you, Brian Browning. Your thoughts on the landscape of the Big Ten right now and as the October 12th matchup looms, as the final matchup of the regular season looms, how do you overall feel about your Buckeyes in this conference right now? I'm biased. I always say Ohio State should win every game. I feel like yeah. they should win every game pretty comfortably. But obviously, we know it don't always go that way. But I think we are uh, are geared up uh, for a very successful season with the expansion of the playoffs. We know it's a little bit more yep. wiggle room until actually getting in there. So I think we're set to have a great year. We have the leadership. We have the experience. And most importantly, we have the talent to kind of get things done. So I think the goals are set. Everyone knows the goals. Everyone knows what it takes to kind of get those uh, accomplished. So we'll be ready to go for sure. So there you go. Uh, Ohio State and Michigan State Saturday. That is the 7 o'clock Eastern time kick on Peacock. So we get a night game in the 53rd meeting between the Spartans and the Buckeyes. Uh, all right, that's going to do it for us here on this edition of Believe in Big Ten. Thanks so much for being with us, Jimmy Bryant. Appreciate you guys joining the program. Be sure to check out all their great content over on Believe in Buckeyes. We'll catch you next week. All right, one other game to look at and used as and use as a bit of a forecast for what's to come here in week five was the uh, battle for the Floyd of Rosedale, which um, Minnesota won last year in rather dramatic fashion after the punt return that looked like was a touchdown wasn't for the Iowa Hawkeyes. Minnesota got the win. That not the case here. Uh, Iowa gets the dub 31 to 14. Minnesota outscored 24 to nothing 
in the second half. Max Brosmer, uh, two interceptions in this game, more than he had thrown in all of the previous games combined. Um, you know, didn't get the rushing output and production that they would have liked from Darius Taylor, just 10 carries and 34 yards. That's the big thing here. Um, it's hard to control the clock when you can't run the football. And uh, so they were outgained 227 yards to 66 yards of total yards in the second half. So that's what's got to that's what's got to change. Um, and obviously, uh, PJ Fleck, you know, talking about that says that's something that's that's not going to happen again. Talking about that performance there in the final uh, couple of quarters, but it can't happen again because now coming in, you've got Michigan, number twelve, Michigan. They're going to the Big House, rather. That is the big noon kickoff on Fox, and will be the one hundred and sixth meeting between these two teams. Uh, Minnesota has lost four straight to Michigan, and it, this is going to be a tough one. Obviously, watching the way that Michigan has sort of morphed themselves back to what we saw last year uh, by doubling down on the run game now that Alex Orgy has taken over as the starting quarterback. So how does Minnesota negotiate that, right? Can they match and go, you know, ball control for ball control, right? Find ways to engineer long drives. Can they find explosive plays with Daniel Jackson when they really need to? Uh, can they find ways to stop the run, which was a big problem against Iowa, especially in the second half this past week? Because you're going to see a big dose of Khalil Mullings. You're going to see a big dose of Donovan Edwards and probably of Alex Orgy running the football uh, as well from the quarterback spot. So to me, this game is really intriguing. One, to see whether the formula for Michigan that helped them beat USC in a massive game and a big-time win at the big house a week ago is sustainable moving forward. Or do we need to see more from Alex Orgy in the past game in order for Michigan to find their ceiling, right? To find uh, the eventual production that will allow them to become a more viable college football playoff contender down the stretch. And then for Minnesota... It's okay. Um, you know, you're two and two here on the season. You're really getting into Big Ten play here. Now, the thick of it, what are you going to look like? Like, is this a team that can handle the rigors of Big Ten play week in and week out? Because, you know, coming in to Minneapolis after this week against Michigan is USC. So, Michigan and USC in back to back weeks, we're going to learn a lot about this Minnesota football team. Is this a team that can find a way to go one and one over the next two and sit there and be three and three through the first half of this season and be halfway to bowl eligibility? Or are we see we talking about a team that's going to be two and four uh, following a, a, and you know, now a three game losing streak uh, to start big 10 play. That's not where PJ flex teams have traditionally been. That's not where they want to be. And so I think we learned a lot about where this Minnesota program will be uh, as we look at that matchup. Uh, Talked a little bit about that Indiana-Maryland matchup, which I think uh, is a big one. Uh, Iowa, who got that big win over Minnesota in the rivalry game, is off uh, this coming week. So I uh, won't really get to see what they have. But I think, you know, we, we talked a lot about Illinois and Nebraska and that Friday nighter from week four. But man, Illinois, 19th ranked team in the country, traveling to Happy Valley to take on a top 10 team in Penn State. Got my eyes on that one. Can't wait to see how Illinois backs up a big time win over Nebraska now with a big time game against Penn State on the road again. They are battle-tested now in tough environments. So I do not think that the environment in Happy Valley will bother these fighting Illini that Brett Bielema has playing really well right now. Watch out for Pat Bryant. He's established himself as one of the better receivers uh, in the conference. So really looking forward to those two matchups in the Big Ten this week. 